Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us for yet another one of our Hot Topic webinars. This is Joyce Davis, and I am uh, the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. And I am delighted to uh, have with me today Andrew Lentz. Uh, and I will read a little bit of his bio for you, but he is going to lead us on our discussion of a most important topic, and that is what is going on in Sudan. Uh, we know there's a war in Ukraine. We now know very well there's a war between Israel and Hamas in the Middle East. But a lot of us do not know about what is going on in a very important part of Africa known as the Sudan. And I want to extend this uh, thanks to our board member, Hajir Al-Sheikh, who has pushed us to make sure that we do not forget what is happening there as this is her native land. And uh, she is a refugee from the political turmoil there. And she is very active uh, here to make sure that we're informed, but also on the world stage, galvanizing people to try to help those who are suffering in Sudan. So with that, I am going to uh, step into introducing uh, Andrew Lentz and also thanking the US Department of State for making such high level expertise available to us here in the boonies. We deserve to have important information and expertise as well. So we thank you for that. But Andrew Lentz is truly an expert in, in this realm. He joined the US Department of State's Foreign Service in 2003. And over his career, he served at embassies in Damascus, Muscat, Cairo, Kampala, and in Erbil. He covered Palestinian economic affairs in the department's Office of Israel and Palestinian Affairs from 2008 to 2010. And he was office director for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor's Office of Near Eastern Affairs for two years, 2020 to 22. And currently he is office director and the Africa Bureau's Office of Sudan and South Sudan Affairs. Now, before he joined the Foreign Service, Mr. Lentz was a Peace Corps agroforestry uh, volunteer in the Gambia. And when he returned to stateside, 
he joined the Cleveland, Ohio-based nonprofit organizing resources of the greater Cleveland's interfaith community to tackle poverty. Uh, he received a master's of public policy from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. And I want to once again welcome him and to say, let him know that we also are very much involved in interfaith activities. In fact, we just helped to lead an interfaith prayer vigil for the Middle East. So you're in good company, Mr. Lentz. So let me turn it over to you. I think we're already, um, we've already agreed on how we're going to do this. We're going to let Mr. Lentz hold forth. Uh, and give us the overview we need so that we can at least ask some intelligent questions going forward. So Andrew Lentz, the, the camera is yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, first of all, thank you for that introduction and, and for, um, uh, for uh, giving the highlights of my bio. Um, there are other highlights that I'm equally as proud of, um, my my family, my kids, um, uh, that give a lot of joy. But thank you for the professional highlights. Um, but also, I'm deeply honored to be with you. Um, and I know before uh, we started the call, understand your background in this part of the world, in Sudan in particular, and then also to your board member. Um, and I just want to acknowledge um, her expertise and um, the expertise of others on the call. Um, and I really hope that I can add, um, give some insights into what the administration is doing, how the administration is trying to end the conflict in Sudan um, and support the Sudanese people's aspirations for freedom, peace and justice and for democratic government. Um, and, and then really be here to uh, take advantage of your expertise, to learn from your questions, um, and then hopefully be able to really um, answer in full. And if I can't answer directly, um, I'm certainly willing to come back um, or to have a follow-up conversation um, as, as appropriate. Um, so really without, uh, I, I think it's important to acknowledge, and I know there are people with, with personal experience on the call, um, but acknowledge the deep suffering and pain of, of the people of Sudan now. Um, the there have been waves of conflict over time that have driven people from the from their country um, that uh, this is not the first conflict in Sudan. Um, but since April 15, um, it has the the pace of the conflict has become more intense, more horrific. Um, the reports of atrocities, including uh, conflict rated sexual violence, I think are deeply appalling and should shock us all. Um, and this fight has gone, this conflict has gone on too long, the suffering's too great, um, and the cost to Sudan's future is really too immense to quantify. Um, and not only do we want to acknowledge before we start talking about the big picture policy things that often sound bloodless and, and at 30,000 feet, but also to the bravery of the Sudanese people. So not only the suffering of the Sudanese people, but the bravery of the Sudanese people. Um, and the fact that on the front lines right now, um, there are um, the, the very people who, who brought down the Bashir regime, who were instrumental in that revolution, are still active in what the in emergency rooms on the front lines, doing with very, very little to keep a frayed uh, medical infrastructure in the country that is buckling and falling apart under the weight of conflict, keeping that alive enough to be able to respond to the emergency needs of people on the front lines of conflict. You've got communities in Darfur, particularly women and young women and children who their incredible resilience, uh, both inside Sudan and also those who have been able to flee Sudan to neighboring countries, um, their bravery and resilience in the face of atrocity, the critical voices of activists, both inside Sudan and outside Sudan, the peacemakers who continued at the local level to try and forge peace in the midst of conflict. We have to remember these two um, and, and, and remember and, um, and acknowledge the deep bravery. Uh, they're doing the hard work. And I think it's their work, uh, as well as the picture of, of, the, of the immensity of the suffering that really animates US policy, animates our approach, and it makes sure, and I can, I can assure you on the call, 
that even with all of the things that we know are going around, but going on in the world, in Ukraine, in, in the Middle East, as you said, Joyce, at the start, that the administration has not taken its eyes off of Sudan. It hasn't taken its eyes off of the, of, of the, the real risk of regional, uh, of, a, of a widening of this conflict in the Horn of Africa um, and is committed to trying to resolve this conflict. Um, and and helping uh, Sudan's democratic transition get on get on track. Um, so that's important to say. We can chew and, and walk and chew gum at the same time. We can focus on what's going on in the Middle East, and we can and we are um, still focused on Sudan and trying to resolve it there. So uh, quickly before I get to what we're doing, just to remind people, um, we were deeply we in. Uh, Nominated our first ambassador, John Godfrey, after a 30-year hiatus to Sudan um, uh, uh, back in August of, 20, of last year. He immediately started to work with, uh, with a, a wide range of Sudanese parties um, to try and get uh, to resume Sudan's democratic transition. Uh, we support, he supported with support from Washington, um, uh, the, what was called the Framework Politi Political Agreement. It was a Sudanese-led effort um, to try and, and really um, recreate a civilian-led transitional government um, and undo the military uh, takeover of power from October 25, 2021. Um, and this for the, the, the course of, of, of the year leading up to April 15, 2023, was a main drive of, of U.S. policy and effort. And really, we got to a point where we felt we were almost there. And I think if you talk to many civilian, to, to many Sudanese, they would say the same thing, that we were making progress on multiple lines of effort, looking at transitional justice issues and security sector reform. But it was, in, it was security sector reform in particular, and the disposition of forces and how the rapid support forces under uh, General Hameti and the Sudanese armed forces under General Burhan at the 11th hour, at the 11.9 hour, they decided they would rather fight than negotiate over the future disposition of forces and whether, how the forces would be integrated and what would become of the different resources that the, different, that, the, that the security apparatus had accumulated. And so since April 15, we have seen these two belligerents go at each other at the expense of the people of Sudan. <clears throat> what we did immediately after April 15 was to engage in emergency diplomacy, uh, working closely with, uh, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which had unique leverage to be able to bring the parties to the table in what we called the Jeddah talks. Um, those talks lasted until about June 21. Um, they were imperfect, and I think many people on this call will know that. Um, they were able to pull together very limited periods of ceasefires that were often broken very quickly after just 24, 36 hours by the parties. Um, but at the end of that time, at the end of what we uh, achieved in Jeddah, we were able to uh, support the evacuation of American citizens and other nationalities and Sudanese who needed to get. So that was one, evacuations of personnel. Two, we were able to allow Sudanese within Sudan uh, to take advantage of pauses in the conflict, to be able to get to places of safety, to reunite families, to bury their dead, to do these kinds of things. We were also um, able to get in uh, Russian humanitarian assistance to 2.5 million people over the time. That is wildly insufficient. It wasn't up to the scale of the problem, but it did affect some lives. Um, by June 21, the, we assessed with our Saudi partners that the, that the belligerent parties were not intent on upholding their commitments of ceasefires or um, really ending their fighting. So we suspended the talks. In the interim, we continued to work hard with trying to get the parties back to the table um, and, uh, and also use what tools we could uh, to try and put pressure. So I think, let, so hopefully that was just a little thumbnail of what led us up to now. Um, but what we're doing is really focusing on three main lines of effort. One is to try and stop the fighting. 
two, to support Sudanese civilians in their efforts to, to shape their own future and the future of their country, a democratic future of their country. And three is to respond to humanitarian crises. So in the first line of effort to stop the fighting, one of the ways we're doing this is through pressure. Um, and since the, the President Biden in May 4th with his executive order, uh, released his executive order, which stated very clearly that it was the policy of the United States to support uh, a democratic Sudan and a civilian-led Sudan, a civilian government, um, we have released multiple tranches of sanctions targeting uh, entities and individuals uh, and the bel belligerents' ability to prosecute the war in an effort to try and make them more amenable and changing their incentives to negotiate, to, to negotiate an end to the conflict. Two, we've used sanctions to respond directly to atrocities, particularly those committed most egregiously by uh, the RSF uh, and in the Darfur area. Uh, in Darfur, and three, to try and prevent anti-democratic spoilers from undermining Sudan's democratic transition and framing the future of the country. So that's our sanction strategy. That's the three main buckets that we've been pursuing. And I think if you go back over time since May 4, you'll see that we've done just that. We've targeted individuals and we've targeted entities. And we continue to look at how we can best use the tools, uh, tools available to us uh, to be able to do that, to keep the pressure on. Another one of those tools is visa restrictions. So you'll see that we've used uh, our ability under what's, so, what's called 3C um, and 7031C to impose visa restrictions on some individuals. Um, another way that we have uh, kept up the pressure is through public condemnation of the party's actions. Um, and we have really led the international community in calling out uh, the uh, a gross violations of human rights, including a conflict-related sexual violence committed by both parties. But really, again, I have to say, and you'll see a change in some of our public rhetoric since the middle of the summer, where we really did see that the rapid support forces and their allied militias were, were committing most of the violations on the ground. Um, particularly as they began to consolidate their authority and power over Darfur area. Um, and, and we were calling them out uh, quite a bit. Um, so we continue to do that, and we will continue to call out and condemn very clearly the actions of the parties. Um, and third, um, through um, really multilateral and regional coordination. Um, and so uh, uh, we are working with um, uh, making sure that our partners in the African Union, partners in the international, in the Intergovernmental Authority on Development in East Africa, uh, in, in, in the European Union, in, in uh, the Neighbors Forum that is led by Egypt, that we're speaking with one voice to make very clear to the parties that there is no acceptable military solution to this conflict. Um, to condemn in, in a unified voice uh, the violations of human rights. Um, and uh, most importantly, to make sure, too, that we are firewalling this conflict um, and trying to prevent uh, actors uh, from providing one source, one side or the other, uh, with arms or material assistance. Um, the other way that we're trying to end this conflict is through negotiation. So I already talked through JEDA round one and what we what we achieved, although it was insufficient, uh, it was something, and why we walked away. I hope that everyone on the call is aware that we then went back to, we were able to um, get the parties back to the negotiating table in JEDA. And JEDA 2.0, if you will, um, had some important structural changes. One is that we expanded the participation of the co-facilitators. So instead of just being the United States and Saudi Arabia, this time we were able to bring in as an a, a absolutely co-equal co-facilitator uh, and the EGAD, uh, the Inter the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. That is important because it uh, Sudan is in Africa; it's not in the Gulf. So it was very important to have African partners at the table, African leadership at the table. Um, and and so EGAD is an important part uh, a, an important partner there. Um, 
The second big structural change was that we decided to um, break up the negotiations into time bound rounds um, of seven to 10 days, which we uh, and that what that did is that it it prevented us as co-facilitators from being uh, hostages to the process and making sure that the parties couldn't come and be comfortable in Jeddah uh, for an extended period of time while the farting, while the fighting continued. And then uh, also in the breaks, it allowed us then to assess whether or not the parties were actually implementing their commitments. And that we wouldn't go back to the, to the negotiating table until we assessed that there was some progress. So we, I, Please look, uh, if you haven't already, November 7, the uh, announcement of the conclusion of round one of JETA 2.0. And what we put out there in the interest of transparency for everybody to see, particularly for Sudanese citizens and those still in Sudan and elsewhere, what the parties agreed to, the confidence building measures, the fact that they agreed to participate in a UN-led uh, humanitarian coordination forum, and then we put in links in the statement that came out over through the State Department, um, links to individual commitments by the, each party, separate commitments by each party in the humanitarian sphere. Um, and so you can see exactly to what they committed. Now we're in a period of pause between rounds where we are working intensively with both with the parties to make sure and keeping pressure again through our public statements, through sanctions, through the threat of sanctions through international coordination um, to try and make sure that the parties are doing what they said they would do. And then we'll assess about going back. So I've talked about pressure, how we're trying to end the conflict. I've talked about how we're using negotiations to try and end the conflict and about multilateral and regional coordination to try and end the conflict. And I also wanna just point out that we, were le we led uh, international efforts to get the Human Rights uh, Council uh, to make sure that there was a a, a fact finding uh, and and a fact finding uh, uh, framework or or mechanism um, that can make sure that it's monitoring and collecting data uh, on what is happening in Sudan for future accountability purposes, uh, but also to make sure that the historical record shows what's going on, and that's important too. Um, the uh, the second main, and I hope this is okay, Joyce. Can I have like three more, four more minutes? Absolutely, absolutely. go ahead. We're, we're, we're riveted. We're getting okay. the information we need, yes. Very good. So then this, the, second, the second big thing that a priority for the United States government as we look at this conflict and feel like, and how we, we, we get out of it, um, is to support Sudanese civilians in their efforts to frame the future of their own country. Um, and we've been pretty resolute and unequivocal in our support uh, for, for Sudanese civilian efforts. Um, and the, the secretary, and I hope that, that everybody on the call also will go and look for uh, the, 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 the secretary's video message to the Sudanese people on May 22nd. And he came out and he said very unequivocally, and it's important to know this, that he said civilians, not the belligerents, not the SAF, not the RSF, but civilians are to determine Sudanese, the Sudan's future. And the secretary alluded to it. Our ambassador, John Godfrey, said it very clearly, and he got a lot of criticism for this uh, from the belligerent parties um, with whom we're trying to negotiate. Um, but he said very clearly that they have that their actions have have clearly shown that they've lost legitimacy to, to lead and that they have no uh, role in future governance. There needs to be an army in Sudan. Uh, there needs to be a force that can protect its borders and and um, and do the things that normal militaries do, but not as the the leaders of the country, not in governance. Uh, so again, May four, the president came out with an executive order saying it was the policy of the United States to support a democratic Sudan and a and a civilian democratic government. The secretary May 22nd came in his video saying it is up to Sudan, Sudan civilians to determine Sudan's future. And then we have backed that up unequivocally stating that the RSF and the SAF have lost legitimacy to lead. So we continue to support um, Sudanese efforts, a broad, diverse group of Sudanese from across the spectrum, resistance committees, 
uh, tr labor unions, women, uh, representatives, marginalized communities, youth, political parties, eminent personalities, if you will, um, that we're trying to help them coalesce and begin to speak with one voice um, so that they can uh, shape the politics of the country going forward. That is the second main line of effort. We continue to do that both diplomatically and with assistance as we can. Um, and thirdly, we continue uh, to be uh, to address the humanitarian needs of the country. And so we are um, the single largest donor uh, of humanitarian assistance to the people of Sudan. Um, we have we continue to lead and encourage donors to step up and increase their contributions. Our contributions comprise more than 50 percent of all the contributions to Sudan. Um, and and it really is important that all of us, those on this call, we do it through our diplomatic channels is to keep uh, the pressure on other donors and other partners who care about the future of Sudan to up their contributions to make sure um, that assistance is going in. Now, the um, I see some uh, messages coming in in the chat box, which I think are important. We're also working very clear, closely with partners and neighbors in the region to make sure that we're also rushing assistance to refugees from the conflict. Um, and making and and helping those countries, making sure that those countries continue to keep their doors open, um, and that they are providing the assistance that those that uh, refugees need. The other thing that we're doing, but it's important, and and this is something that I would love to hear uh, uh, experience from those on the call too. But we're looking for ways, and we are already doing it to support also the emergency rooms within Sudan. So not just uh, we're working with the UN, we're working with the major international implementing partners, but we're also looking for ways of how we can get assistance to Sudanese at the grassroots level, on the front lines that are trying to meet the immediate needs in conflict areas. I'm not going to lie to you, it's hard. And it's not the way that big donors normally work. So we're really trying to learn as we go. We're trying to... Um, identify quickly the partners that we can rush assistance to. We're trying to scale it up once we've we've gotten lessons learned, but also very conscious of the do no harm principles because these people are not just, they're, as I said at the top, they're brave and they're under threat and they're gonna continue to be under threat, particularly if there's a big uh, waving American flag there uh, over their heads. So in sum, I think, uh, I think that's enough to hopefully get the conversation started. Absolutely. Yeah. We are focused. We've got, we know we've got to end the conflict. We've got to support the Sudanese people's democratic aspirations, and we've got to meet immediate humanitarian needs. And we're trying to do it with all the tools at our disposal. So let me stop there. I, I think that was an excellent overview. You've got two warring generals who are simply battling out in the most brutal fashion, threatening women, especially with, with sexual violence. I mean, this is just beyond the pale of anything that anybody should be able to tolerate on planet Earth. That being said, I mean, we get it why we should care about this. One of the questions that's come in is one we get all the time. And why should Americans care, right? Why we're repeatedly told about the strategic importance of the United States uh, with Ukraine and of the Middle East. So again, we should at least address this issue. Now for me, it's just humanitarian. We're on this planet earth. This should not be allowed to happen, but are there other arguments we can make to people who simply say it's not our issue? It's not our problem. Yes. And I, and I think you're absolutely right. And, and I don't think we should, I'm, I'm not, and please Joyce, I'm not saying you are, I think we should um, not be ashamed and we should almost full stop say, why do we care? It's because one, we can't have another genocide happen right. under our collective individual watch on this planet. So I think there is real reason to worry about this. There is real, uh, we should be deeply concerned about the reports of ethnically targeted killings, of ethnically targeted um, and uh, uh, sexual related, uh, conflict related sexual violence of the multi, I mean, you read the, the stories of women who have escaped this conflict and I think as, as our ambassador, Linda Thomas Greenfield um, said in her opening remarks to a humanitarian conference in Cairo just recently, um, that as horrific as this is, 
that people have escaped the conflict into Chad or other places, in some cases, they're the lucky ones. Um, because the people who have remained, the IDPs, those who are still um, suffering day to day um, from the conflict, um, they, they are facing immense horror, horrific horrors. And even the refugees who have escaped, they are still um, uh, under threat. Um, and so I think the, um, you know, and you read their horrible testimonials of, you know, this one woman uh, saying that she can't even remember how many times she's been raped at this point. Oh. Um, so I think that is a reason we should care as human beings, as those who don't want to see this happen uh, ever again in our lifetime. That's one reason. I think second, just looking at the geography of where Sudan is, it is on the Red Sea. It is straddles both sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. Um, it is on a a line across the continent uh, that is called the Sahel. I know all of you on this call know that. I apologize for sounding like you don't. No, um, you but I think, yeah, but this is a, clearly, yeah. yeah, but it's a critical area. And I think you've seen across, you know, what, you know, what's going on in Gabon, in Niger, in Mali, uh, across the board, where spaces of conflict, where there is poor governance, is becoming areas where extremist groups are finding footholds, mm -hmm. where you see Wagner and other groups like this coming in to uh, and and taking advantage of these spaces um, that are uh, vacuums, and so this is another reason we should care that the that that if this conflict is allowed to spiral more out of control to break down along tribal lines. And, and if Sudan ends up being partitioned into something that looks like a Darfur and an East Sudan, um, I think you're gonna find that there are very bad actors who are gonna take advantage of this. Um, and it's not only gonna affect uh, the interests of the Sudanese people, our friends in the region, but someday very soon, it's gonna come to our borders. So I think that's another reason uh, that we should desperately care about this. Um, so let me stop there. Maybe that's uh, enough. I think those are all very good points. You brought up Wagner, and we'll get back to some of this. But I'm going to let Hajir. Hajir, I have unmuted you. I think you're able to speak now if you want to ask a question or make a comment as well. We've got a lot of territory to cover here, but I thought I'd let yes. you. Yes. Go ahead, Hajir. Yes, yes. First of all, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you, Joyce, for bringing awareness to this uh, important matter. And uh, what Andrew covered here is exactly what I was looking to for people to know and hear, because unfortunately, sometimes we have to know why we should care. Just being human and caring about other human, uh, it is not enough anymore. Um, but I wanted to just bring attention to the gross human rights violation that is happening. Uh, many cases of rape, torture, human trafficking now happening. And that's something is not you don't see and you don't hear a lot in the media anymore. Um, there are bad um, cases of even uh, like you just stated, Andrew, even after they escape as a refugee, even from before refugees face uh, many struggles and obstacles where they're at. Now it is even more uh, if we consider the large amount of people that are fleeing to Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, Chad, and neighboring countries. And I do understand that there is a large uh, amount that is actually seeking refuge in those countries and they might not be able and ready to take them in. But part of our um, a struggle is uh, we meet every two weeks in an advocacy team. So then advocacy team with several organizations, including um, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch, we meet with Congress um, to discuss what we can do, um, providing camps around uh, the borders, which is not something hard. There are many parts in Sudan that are safe, Port Sudan, you, uh, the areas close to the north, close to the um, border with Egypt. Uh, why can't we uh, pressure um, UN or or us here try to provide uh, at least a um, medication, provide uh, um, you know relief in that 
uh, area. Uh, we can pressure our allies, Egypt, Saudi, UAE, etc., to um, better the uh, 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 like the, the life situation for for refugees there. They are still struggling, and yet they, they escape Sudan, but they are still facing uh, rape, torture, uh, uh, you know, um, hunger. A lot of homeless. Uh, there is no jobs there. Yeah. So it's not like you're, they're not trying to work or do something. There is nothing that so they I can do. You're asking also, I mean, thank you for, for laying out for us just how horrendous the situation is. And I know you're in regular contact with people uh, here and, and there who are, who are experiencing this. But I think what she's asking, Andrew, is, is there more that could be done, more safe havens created? Or, or what's the obstacle to being able to do that, even if it's refugee camps along the borders? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And, and thank you for your... Uh, I know your personal experience and what you're bringing to this conversation. Um, and really it, it's a, it's a great honor to be able to, to learn from you and hear from you. Um, and, and I, and, and also just quickly, thank you for the advocacy with uh, the human rights community, as well as with, with Congress. I think the more that we do these kinds of things, um, we all have to hold each other accountable. We all have to be pressing each other. Um, the Hill has a role to play. Our uh, advocacy community has a role to play just as much as the administration. So we need to be in this together. Um, yes, of course, there's there's always more that we should be doing and could be doing. Um, you know, one of the things that we're <clears throat> doing um, that is important about the, the, the outcomes of this second round of JEDA is the humanitarian focus of it. And so, you know, our priority going into this is to make sure that we are um, really we prioritize the human humanitarian response in this round. And I and and well, let me finish that thought, and then I'll come back to a second one that I really do want value pushback and and hearing from you. But prioritizing that um, the uh, prioritizing empowering UN OCHA um, to make sure that they are really leading in terms of. Uh, coordination on the humanitarian assistance front to engaging the belligerent parties to make sure that they are tearing down obstacles to humanitarian assistance, that they are uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, um, uh, approving visas in, a, in an expedited manner, that they are not holding up shipments of, of goods that need to get into the country, um, and that the two sides, and you'll see in their commitments what they committed to do, is to, prov to provide safe corridors to assistance to get in to conflict areas. Um, and so these are priorities. These are things that we're trying to work on. Um, that is the goal, is to make sure that we are um, getting enough, uh, getting to a place where conflict can stop, where the parties can agree to create and carve out these safe areas, at least safe corridors, that, um, that the humanitarian uh, workers, both international and Sudanese, are able to do what they need to do uh, to help people. So I think your point is well taken. We've got to be creative. We've got to be looking at how we can um, uh, get our, our assistance to, to people more efficiently and more quickly. Um, I acknowledge the fact that that's not always the case. And I think I've heard a lot from folks on the front line, Sudanese in the emergency rooms who are like, I hear you, you're, you're throwing around numbers, 800 million, a billion. I don't see it. I'm still sitting here in Khartoum um, with fighting all around me and I'm running out of the very basics of, of let alone uh, the people who need real life-saving surgery. Where is it? We hear that and we're really trying to address it. Um, it, it really does come down to, and, it, and over and over, we hear this also from Sudanese, okay. you've got to stop the conflict. That if yeah. we can't get the parties to stop fighting, the humanitarian response becomes all the tougher. Um, yeah, I can't remember the other point, but I'll get back to it. And Hajira, we will work together because we really do need to get our associates and all to write to our Congress people, to let them know that yeah. this is as important an issue as the others. and But as he said, also any pressure we can apply or we can help to apply on 
other donors who need to be stepping up in, in this conflict and helping. Yeah. Let, let's get to some of the questions that have, we've got several here. One of the can, questions- Can I say, uh, can I interrupt you just for one second? Yeah, and ahead. it will be very, very brief. But I think also just know that, um, you know, resources are a problem and they're scarce. And the conversation in Congress is often, um, you know, when the administration comes forward with, with supplementals and a request for additional funding, some of that money is for humanitarian responses around the world, but also in Sudan. And so that's an important form of advocacy too, uh, that if people care about the humanitarian needs of the Sudanese, um, it takes money and we need the Congress to hear that. Absolutely. Um, I have a question from uh, that says, can you please speak more about the withholding of visa processing as a pressure tactic? And the question is, does that cause more harm to civilians? Um, if, mm. if Is that hurting their ability to just leave if you're doing these kinds of uh, pressures on withholding visas? We get it for the bad guys, but is it hurting the good guys too? No, I, I, I would say no. I mean, the, the tools that we're, we are trying to be very conscious. We're very conscious of that. And so the tools that we have uh, are using are targeted. And they are targeted and you'll see it. And I really do want people to go back and take a look um, at what we've announced over time. You can go to Treasury's website, uh, you know, search up OFAC, Sudanese sanctions. You can see also, if you go to the State Department's website, you can see the public announcements from the spokesperson or media notes from the secretary's office. But you'll see that we specifically name who we're sanctioning. We specifically, um, uh, in cases where we can't due to privacy laws uh, of kind of visa consular privacy laws, you'll see exactly the class of individuals that we're targeting. Um, so this is not a wide, kind of a broad blanket uh, sanction um, that's hitting uh, the victims of this conflict. We are targeted and it's meant to try and change the calculus and change the incentives uh, for the belligerent parties. Very good. There's also a question that says, can you say more about firewalling, blocking the sale of arms to the region? How does this work and how is it enforceable? Yeah, no, it's, it's, this is a great question. And so, um, you know, what I meant by that is it's a key part of our regional diplomacy and a key part of our uh, international diplomacy, working with our partners in the African Union, in EGAD, in the European Union, at the, um, you know, all of our like-minded partners on the continent and off the continent, um, that we, we are trying to, we're making very clear that there is no acceptable military solution to this conflict and that we have to stop uh, uh, any act, any country or actor um, from providing assistance to one side or the other. Um, this is a hard work. I think you can read the New York Times, you can read the Wall Street Journal, and you'll see that we haven't been 100% successful, um, that uh, there are still uh, reports of credible reports um, that goods are getting into the country um, and supporting one, both sides. Um, but it doesn't mean that we, that we don't stop the diplomatic work. And this is private uh, dip diplomacy as well as public diplomacy. But I also have to tell you, um, and just for your awareness, I mean, it would be great to be able to go into the UN Security Council, It'd be great to go to the UN. That seems like a natural place where you could go and you could create a unified voice and, 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 uh, be able to implement and enforce international UN sanctions to stop this. But the council dynamics are horrible. Yes, they are. And so, you know, it seems like a no brainer that you could go in there and say, hey, guess what, Security Council, you already passed a resolution, 1591, that says nobody should allow arms into Darfur. Mm hmm. But even getting people on the council these days to be able to acknowledge that precedent and to, to enforce it is hard. I'm, that sounds like I'm whining. I'm not whining. But I think it's important for us to know that the diplomacy on this is complicated given the, the you know, over time where we are with Russia and China in particular, I have to say, um, that uh, it makes coordinated international uh, effort difficult. 
Um, but we continue to try and tackle this problem as in all the different ways that we can. Right. So this brings us to this larger question. Who's fueling all of this? What, who are these outside players? What role is Russia and China and playing in all of this? So, so let's talk about the big global picture here. And we already brought up Wagner, you know, and their forces being all over Africa and wanting a foothold here. Who's fueling this? And what role are these big powers playing? Yeah, I think, um, I think the, the, I want us to, there's certainly some geopolitics and these kinds of things out there. Excuse me. I mean, the world is as it is. But I do think it's important to say who's fueling it is the RSF and the SAF and extremists on both sides. Um, there are elements of the former Bashir regime uh, who would love to get back into power uh, and fueling it. There are actors who participated in the genocide of 2003, 2004, that time period in Darfur, who are still active, who are doing the same crimes they did before, who are fueling this. So I do think it's important that we keep the focus where the focus needs to be. And primarily it's the belligerents who are doing this. Um, but then uh, as they continue to fight it out, it creates more and more opportunity for people to pick a side, yeah. to begin to look at what their own interests are uh, and, try and, and try and advance them by supporting one side or the other. Um, it plays in, the conflict plays into regional dynamics that are already there. I mean, you've got tensions pre-existing, pre-existing tensions between Egypt and Ethiopia, between mm -hmm. uh, over the GERD and use of Nile water. You've got um, Wagner, as you said, kind of present and running around. So the more this conflict goes on, the more that the extremists in the SAF and the RSF fuel this thing, the more that parties are going to try and take advantage of it. Now, I can say that, you know, I think Russia and China, it's important in the, in the, in the context of the Security Council and other things, there are dynamics there that make, uh, that, make that difficult. I'm not, there is not some big like China forces coming in or, you know, Russian forces coming in. Fortunately, and we just have to try and keep it this way, Sudan has not become the new like geopolitical uh, or kind of geostrategic global battlefield. But I think that's what is so critical about the focus of US diplomacy and the focus of what we're trying to do with our partners in the region and elsewhere is to stop this conflict before we get to something like that. And it's not a hard thing to imagine where you go from the country splitting to the regional powers all, all of a sudden getting concerned, starting to do proxy stuff, to then all of a sudden that, that blossoms out and starts affecting other efforts. And then all of a sudden you do have something bad. Right. That, so, that's what yeah. Nigeria's warning. She's saying in 2018, uh, they met with con Congress uh, people and they warned. <laughs> about the Wagner Group's involvement and the possibility of Russia and China seeing an opportunity to exactly. advance whatever That's the thing. Yeah, seeing yeah. That. So, so it is it is very much an issue. Um, let me see what else we have here. We have so many things there. Um, we, we've talked about the firewalling of, of a sale of arms in the region and if that's enforceable. Um, the, the other question that I think is 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 still out there is, how large of a factor is control of the country's natural resources? I mean, are they clearly they're fighting to control the country, but what else is are there natural resources at oh, yeah. stake here? Absolutely. <clears throat> and I think it's one of the things that we are, if you look at our sanctions, um, we're trying to we get at this a bit. Um, and you'll see that we targeted. Um, some companies involved in the gold, gold extraction, gold trade. Um, and we've also tried to call attention um, through uh, uh, one tool that's not a sanction tool, um, but to say that, that the international supply chain should recognize or know that any gold coming out of Sudan is conflict affected. Mm -hmm that we need to be aware of that. And hopefully we were hoping to send a signal to the private sector and others that um, this is dirty stuff. Um, and so Sudan is a big gold producer. 
Um, and right now that the RSF has control of a lot of the gold fields. Mm -hmm. And so what we're concerned is that the gold can be one of the resources that can fuel this conflict. And certainly it's one of the things that would have, uh, you know, as we start thinking about that, I think the RSF and others uh, in the security establishment did not want to lose control of as they started to think about, hmm, what does a civilian government look like? And what does it mean for a civilian control of an economy? I think this is something that uh, that certainly was probably a, a precipitating factor of conflict and will be a driver of conflict. So we have to keep focused on that. And then also, I think post-conflict, look, ending the war is almost the simplest bit of this thing. Yeah. Because if we ever get to a, a post-conflict situation, I think as you said, or as Hajir said, the, the economy is an absolute ruin. Um, it's going to take billions to, 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 to rebuild. I think there's going to be a knee-jerk sense in the international community that um, we've gone down this road before uh, and we're going to be worried about the fact that the military is just going to come back in, there's going to be another coup and all of a sudden we're going to have to be suspending aid again. I think there's going to be worry about that. Yeah. And then I think the warring parties and the elites in different, uh, you know, are going to also be very concerned still about civilian oversight and control of natural resources. And this could be another flashpoint. So, I mean, we're going to have, we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. And and that I think is the, is the other reason why it's so critical for people on this call to keep advocacy with the human rights community, advocacy on the Hill, advocacy with the administration. We're going to have to keep focused. And that's not an easy thing in our policy environment, as all of you know. Absolutely. We lose focus quite quickly. Yeah, and, and uh, Hajir is also warning us or, or advising us that uh, the Janjaweed is supported by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. So that's also other players that are involved. You've already mentioned Saudi Arabia being brought in and, and seemingly trying to play a constructive role at this point, you believe? Yeah, I believe. Okay. I mean, I think, I think the, you know, our approach and our thought on, um, I mean, I, everyone in the administration is, feels disgusted that we've got to negotiate with these two parties. I mean, I can I can be quite honest about that. It's yeah. despicable and it's disgusting. But I think there's also a realization that you've got to talk to the people with the guns and the power if you're going to get an end to the fighting. So I think there's a realization in the near term, at least, that we have to be engaging with these despicable people with blood on their hands. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but then to make to be able to get them to the table, we also have to be able to work with parties that we assess have particular leverage over them. And so what we have found is that Saudi Arabia is a party with that particular leverage. The parties, the belligerent parties have identified the United States and Saudi Arabia as um, the least biased of potential facilitators. And also now in, in this new expanded format, uh, EGAD, um, in the person of the uh, executive secretary, I believe that's his title, uh, Workne, former foreign minister of Ethiopia, who's very productive and constructive partner. <clears throat> but see us as uh, the most, uh, the least biased. Um, but we have to keep, so, you know, that's why I think, yeah, it's constructive. Uh, we need to use them. We need to take advantage of this. Um, but we also need to keep working um, and seeing how we can bring in Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, others, Chad, um, as we start seeking really uh, um, uh, a final solution. Uh, the, the, that's a really bad term. Um, a secession of hostilities, a stable secession of hostilities um, for uh, to this conflict. Right. We're going to need their voices there. I think you've addressed some of this already, but uh, one person is asking, how is USAID US, uh, helping in Sudan? I think you laid out that there's a lot of uh, humanitarian work that's being done, but a lot more needs to be done. Yeah. Um, and and, and that, that is the issue. Let me read a little bit here, uh, just so that we understand the sentiment, at least of those who are on the call. He said, one person is telling us that the truth is that both of the generals, Hameti and General Al Burhan, are criminals and have hands in ethnic genocide in Darfur and other crimes after the revolution. 
They fund ways to escape punishment due to the lack of seriousness of the international uh, community, including the United States, he says, and they're leaving civilians to confront the military machine of both sides, making the matter difficult. On the Sudanese, in all parts of Sudan, the sanctions are on paper and have no effect on the ground. The United States, the United Nations, the African Union, and other actors must take decisive measures and stop the war immediately. I think that truly is the sentiment that I, I think everybody wants to stop mm -hmm. the war immediately. And I, I think we've heard that all of these efforts frequently have holes in them. They they are not airtight uh, in, in, in carrying out it and getting things done. But I guess since we're closing, one of the well, two questions I want. Can to I leave. can I just respond to, to that because I think yeah. I think you're absolutely right, and and I have to say over the almost twenty years as a uh, diplomat with, I'm I'm often humbled at at how little leverage sometimes it feels that a, that a superpower like the United States has, um, and it is frustrating to feel that we can. Um, you know, deploy the tools that we have and to then see uh, actors still act with seeming impunity. Um, but I think what I can assure the person who wrote that, that we're not, we are continue to, uh, we continue to see, to, to try and get more and more creative with the tools that we have to see how we can do them in coordination with our partners to make sure that there are fewer gaps in the sanctions uh, network um, and so that they can be more effective and, and really begin to bite. Um, that we are really looking for ways that we can name and shame and, and, and um, limit their ability and access to resources to prosecute this conflict. And we're really looking at both short-term and long-term accountability. So please be assured we're not satisfied with what the what's happening. We're not satisfied with what we've brought to the table, and we continue to look at better at ways that we can do more. Thank you. That I think that was important to say. Also, unfortunately, it looks like these people have no shame. So shame, <laughs> I think, is something that clearly um, has some issues there. But the other thing I wanted you to talk about as we as we go forward is. Really, what is the road ahead? What are, what would you we, we expect in the in the at least as far as the efforts to stop this? And then just to lament and to just hear your thoughts on why is the world so inept? And I'm not talking about just the United States because one country can only do so much. But the United States, no one seems to be able to stop these kinds of horrific abuses that are happening all over the world now. I almost believe, and believe it or not, let's let's argue over this, my my audience here. We need a war, world policeman. I'm ready for a world policeman, and I know that is easier said than done. But someone, we have to have something able to stop these kinds of abuses that are going to end up impacting all of us eventually. So, with that diatribe, Andrew, I'm going to let you have the closing remarks. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. No, I love it. I wish. Uh... I wish we could. Um, I, I share that. Um, uh, you know what I'm. What I am proud of in being a part of this administration is I do think there's a real commitment to trying to make multilateralism work, um, and there is a real commitment to try and work with our uh, continental partners in the African Union and EGAD and ECOWAS on the west uh, in Western Africa and and other players to really try and 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 pool our resources and speak with one voice and do this. And I think, you know, that is a far cry from world police. Um, but I, but I do think it is, it is important and we shouldn't overlook it. Um, and, and hopefully we'll continue. Um, the, uh, you know, in Sudan, I, I, I want to, there are some, I, I think we have to, to be very uh, eyes wide open that this conflict could go on for a while. And I think, um, you know, the, the so far, regardless of the pressure of the world, the all the things that we've tried to do, um, these parties seem intent on battling it out, and um, and that's horrific. 
Uh, and so, you know, that's one thing um, that we need to be realistic about this. Um, the There are horrible potential scenarios that I hope um, we don't see. But, you know, you could see um, a split of the country. You could see uh, a, uh, a real... Uh, you know, an increase in, in human suffering and atrocity. You could see, um, uh, you know, an increasing tribalization of this conflict uh, uh, that is going to make it harder to resolve. I think all those things are possible. Um, but what then we are committed to do and we're going to keep doing uh, is to intensify our efforts to try again to end the conflict as soon as we can. Um, we've got the Jetta platform. We're not content with just uh, the Jetta platform and doing negotiations that are about um, small confidence building measures and small humanitarian commitments. Uh, that's a piece of what we're doing, uh, but also we're uh, engaging in other diplomatic efforts to really try and uh, and and get to a ceasefire that can lead to a real secession of hostilities. Um, we are going to continue, as I said, to uh, increase our, our commitment to meeting the humanitarian needs of the Sudanese people. And I think what the, the one uh, of uh, the person who wrote that really, really well written and thoughtful uh, response about the conflict, I think, um, yeah, the Sudanese people are bearing the brunt of this um, and they don't have the weapons uh, and all that uh, that the belligerents do. Um, and there is going to be continued suffering. But I think what is critical for us, and, and we're going to keep doing it, is to make sure that, that Sudanese civilians who are on the front lines of meeting needs and also starting to come together to plan for a transition post-conflict and to plan for future civilian governance, that they are going to have the weight and support of the U.S. government behind them. Um, we're going to do it rhetorically. We're going to do it with real resources. We're going to do it with our diplomatic power. Um, and that's important for us to say, and we're going to keep saying it. Um, and so hopefully in a mixture of our sanctions and our pressure, of our focus on negotiations and diplomacy, on our focus in bilateral and multilateral space to create these uh, coalitions, um, uh, uh, coalitions around Sudan, and for our support for civilians uh, uh, that we can get someplace um, that can put Sudan back on track and and end this conflict. Um, so maybe I'll. Uh, I hopefully that's sufficient. Um, I think, Joyce I is think closing. That, that has been. I think you've given us just what we wanted. This overview and an opportunity for others to share. Uh, Jennifer, I think is asking the best avenues. We the best avenues is just to support what I think uh, Andrew has mentioned. We need to make sure our elected officials at all levels, especially in Congress know that we care about this and know that we expect the United States to remain engaged in peacemaking efforts. So write, call, harass, <laughs> I mean, in a, in a peaceful way, let them know that this is important to you and to, and to their constituents. And I want to also give this opportunity to, to read what Hajir wrote. She says, many people don't know the behind the scenes and all the work <laughs> you, Andrew, State Department and Congress are doing. Adriel, go ahead. Do you want to say it yourself? Yes, yes. I just wanted to say, first of all, Andrew, I want to thank you so very much. And uh, many people will not know how much effort and work you, the State Department, Congress, and all our elected officials do try or try. Let's just say that. And as you said, it is easy for us to hope for the war to end and to do our best, but at the end of the day, we have two uh, criminals who are not going to stop or they will stop at nothing to get to mm -hmm. power. So I just want to thank you. And I want to ask from everyone who is listening now that just uh, write to your uh, elected official, um, voice your opinion, voice your concern, and raise awareness. There is nothing uh, small from just hashtag, uh, you know, talk to the people you know, raise awareness and not just about Sudan. We need to care about human rights and humanitarian crisis everywhere. So thank you, Joyce, 
Much love thank to you, you. and thanks, thank Andrew. You. Thank you, Hajir, and really sincere thanks to the State Department and to Andrew. And I will remind everyone on this call and who may view this later, there are, is a forum open to you with Penn Live. We take op-eds. We take letters to the editor. I don't get enough of them involved about international issues. Send them to me, jdavis at penlive.com. You will see them published if they are done in a good way. So you, the door is open for you. But thank you again, Andrew. And we look forward to perhaps inviting you again for an update when the news will be better. I would be honored. Thank you so much to you and to everybody. All right. Enjoy your evening, everyone. Goodbye.